Welcome to church this morning. Uh, we hope that you're um, settled, ready, got your cup of coffee, and uh, you're comfortable in your slippers. We um, are going to be doing communion together in just a little while, so if you want to press pause now, and you can go and get some, um, some bread and some um, orange juice or some juice to use for that, now would be the time to do it. Really looking forward to spending time with you. Bless you.
Let me pray for us. Lord, you have shown that you are with us. Each day your presence is with us and sometimes it's recognised and other times not. Help us to see your work. This week we have seen storms and yet many of us have been kept safe in our isolation. Thank you for keeping us safe. We know too of many who are struggling with loneliness and isolation and perhaps boredom. But with each of us, in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, be with us. Be with the older folk, with the sick and the fragile. Be with the disabled, the poor and the disappointed. Be with the widow and widower and with the displaced. We know your care for them. And Lord, we know things are now returning to a state of openness Allow us to be your representatives in care. Give us the foresight to see those in need and how we can assist them. Lord, for us as a church, give us patience before we resume our live services. Help us to stay calm and sensible as the time gets closer. Give our leadership great wisdom in how they put things together for the return of the live worship, Bible studies, small groups, youth group, kids' church, and playtime and mainly music. Be with those groups who have hired our building at different times in the past as well, as they return. Allow our ministry to them to show your care. Lord, for us as individuals, be with us in our personal circumstances and continue to show your love providence and guidance. We thank you for being such a personal God and that we can come to you with all our cares and worries, but also with our joys and triumphs. Lord, we want to bless you and we want to worship you. Amen. One thing is difficult for us to do as a church at the moment, because we're so scattered, is to do the Lord's Supper or Communion. Christ is with us wherever we are, and we can share this meal with him, even if we're by ourselves. One of my old bosses used to have communion with his family once a week at home. If you were invited for tea on that night, you were included. It was great to see how personal it becomes when it's done as a family. Perhaps some of us will experience that today as families. Another one of my bosses used to have communion as a staff from time to time. Only a few of us, but it was significant, again we may be like that. When I was off sick last year, I I missed communion, so I had it by myself on Sunday morning. Marianne and the boys went to church, and I just had it by myself. Well, not by myself, because Jesus was with me. And some of us will experience that today. Let's share together. Let's follow what Paul shared with the people of the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 11 says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, how the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, gave thanks and broke it in pieces saying, This is my body that is for you. Keep doing this in remembrance of me. Let's do that simply. Grab your piece of bread and break it and then eat it and remember Jesus. The passage continues in verse 25. He did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup, is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink from it, keep doing this in remembering me. Again, we follow the text. Take the cup, drink, and remember.
Now there is much that can be said and shared about the communion service. But what we have done this morning is just follow the text and being obedient to God. It is about remembering Jesus and what he has done, what he means to us and how our relationship to him works. One more bit from the passage from verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Notice it says you proclaim Jesus' death. We've just done that. Proclaimed what Jesus did on the cross. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for what you did on the cross. And thank you that we can remember that demonstration of your love. Thank you for who you are, our Saviour, our friend and our God. Thank you too for the relationship that we have with you, for the closeness we experience and the friendship we can have. You are truly amazing. Thank you. Amen. the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Luke 16, 1 to 15. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be a manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? Nine hundred gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it four hundred and fifty. Then he said to the second, How much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill and make it eight hundred. 
The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Welcome to uh, 
the next part of our series on uh, parables. Uh, we're in week nine of parables, although we've had mission month uh, for five weeks in the middle. This parable is called The Shrewd Manager. The parable read to us is, uh, is a weird one. It seems to advocate dishonesty. Yet I think the key verse is, is actually after the parable. If we just read the few verses um, from verse 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? It's interesting, isn't it, that that comes after the parable that we've looked at. Talking about money and money management is a bit of a no-no in church circles these days. Uh, nobody wants to be criticised and nobody wants to be seen as being a bad steward. This parable is labelled by some scholars as the hardest parable to decipher. But still, we've got to look at it. And the parable does give us some examples. This, this is the first one. Be clever. So he called in each of the master's debtors and he asked the first, how much do you owe the master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than other people of the light. There's a couple of things here for us to have a look at. Firstly, he uses the master's property for his own purposes. That's not good. It's probably why he's called a dishonest manager. And secondly, you notice he didn't want the real value back, but he got something back. Obviously, turnover was an important thing, but still, it's not good. But the master complimented him for his shrewdness. The, master was, the manager was being let go and sacked for reasons we don't know, but I think it's probably because he was dishonest and he became known to be dishonest and he wasn't ethical. But the master admired the way that he was shrewd. Fourthly, uh, people are good at dealing with people of like mind, in this case the dishonest manager. And we will look at, at who it's addressed to, the whole parable, uh, in a few minutes' time. The master commended him, but notice it doesn't say he got his job back. We don't know the outcome of that. Also, verse, we, verse 9 is really weird. It says, I tell you, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Gain friends by using money. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? And it's interesting that it's, it's something we frown at, that people use their money to, to gain popularity or friendship. Send yourself broke, I suppose, is one way of looking at it, by being generous with, to win friends. And I wonder if there is a sharing of people's concept, concept here, sharing with people concept. After all, this is a parable, even if it is hard to work out what the example is from it. But, but look at verse 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Verse 11 goes on to say, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, will you, who will trust you with true wealth? True, isn't it? Someone who is trustworthy with the little things usually can be trusted with big stuff. And the flip side is true also. Someone who rips people off in little bits will also rip people off big time if they get a chance. 
Verse 11 is interesting as it seems to correlate trustworthiness with money or physical things with trustworthy with spiritual matters. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Trustworthiness becomes a part of one's psyche, if you want to put it that way. And then it goes from the psyche to become part of one's lifestyle. In some ways, verse 12 sums it up. And if you have not been trustworthy with somebody else's property, who will give you property of your own? One interpretation of this is to read it in context with the prodigal son from from Luke 15, which is the parable straight before this one. The younger son was not trustworthy in his inheritance. Neither was the shrewd manager in this parable. Yet, both seem to have been treated with an element of grace, don't they? So is this parable an extension of the prodigal son? Perhaps so. Is the manager to be sacked for his lack of wisdom? See the possibilities of connecting the two here? Lack of wisdom by the son, lack of wisdom by the manager. We may also see a, a, a different life conclusion for ourselves. Verse 13 has an interesting spin on this idea. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You either love money and wealth or you love God is the concept here. So the trust factor is about priorities. Is God more important to you than cash? Actually, how does our attitude to God affect the trust, our trustworthiness with money? Well, I think this is where we get the idea of having God as the main priority in our life and that does affect our subsequent priorities. So assisting people with money, even to a point where it may um, affect one's own wealth and comfort is probably a possible result if we put God at the top of our list. That's why this parable and this teaching go hand in hand. The question we ask ourselves is, how does my relationship with God flow through and affect my attitude to wealth and particularly to integrity? Notice who this parable is addressed to. Verse 14 says, The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourself in the eyes of others, but God knows your heart. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Wow. This is addressed to religious people. Ever get the feeling that sometimes the Bible is evaluating our own motives? After all, in our society, we are seen as the religious ones. Yes, us Christians. Yep, uh, in some ways, that's why some of this stuff is written, so we get to evaluate where, evaluate where we are. It's our big picture. So where are we at? How have we reacted to this parable and the surrounding teaching? Are we willing to use our finances to make eternal friends? Are we willing to put our financial safety and security on the line to influence people for Jesus? Crikey, makes you think, doesn't it? Have a great week. Bless you. And I hope and pray you'll think about and read back over that particular parable. See ya.
the benediction. Lord, send us out today to be your people. As opportunities arise to share you and your love, help us to take hold of them and proclaim who you are. And now may the grace, mercy and peace of God the Father, Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit be with each of us wherever we are until you come. In your name, amen.